is um, um, is a, a Dr. Taha Jaffer uh, from a Scotia Bank. Um, his, uh, the title of the talk is Hurricane Modeling Applied to COVID-19 Predictions. Um, and um, Dr. Jaffer is currently focusing on AI applied to managing structural interest rate risk at Scotia Bank. Um, he has been the, the head of wholesale banking and treasury AI and was responsible for large scale AI initiatives in global treasury, global banking uh, and markets and commercial banking. Uh, before his current position at Scotiabank, um, he was a special executive advisor in AI at TD, uh, a principal at the Carlyle Group and has held positions in multiple asset management firms um, with a focus on alternative investments. He holds a PhD in electrical and computer engineering, a master's in biomedical engineering and a master's in mathematical finance uh, from all of them from the University of Toronto. So we welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Jaffer and uh, I see he's already um, docked. The presentation is ready to go. Please take it away. Can you can you hear us? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, thank you. please. Point, pointing to the wrong speaker, sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you uh, again for the opportunity to uh, uh, talk to you through some of the work that we have done um, as part of the, uh, the modeling table, as well as uh, welcoming me to talk to you about a few different ways of thinking about forecasts and how we do forecasts, uh, and especially for COVID-19. Um, some time ago, let me move this forward. Some time ago when uh, the pandemic started, there was a, a real challenge in trying to predict where things were going to go. And at that time, um, there was some usage of compartmental models and some usage of time series models. But you know, as the pandemic had started, the, the, the sample size was so small that it became very difficult to really uh, estimate what we thought was going to happen. Now we have ways of doing this on the risk management style um, in, in finance. And that really is what we think of as historical analogs. Um, one of the ways in which we think about it is uh, what we do when we, when if you go back you know, to the 1920s and 1930s when they were trying to predict where hurricanes were going to go, um, they looked at past hurricanes and where those hurricanes had passed through to get some sense as to what the trajectory might be. Now on the, on the right-hand side here, I have two uh, images of a hurricane path. So the first one is done through a physical model, very similar to what we would think of as a, as a compartmental style model, where you're trying to capture the mechanics of the physics of what's going on, where you have wind patterns and wind speeds, uh, landfall densities, uh, different things that are happening in the atmosphere. And you try to figure out what paths are likely to happen. And then the second one below is one where you just look at a path of hurricanes um, that have passed through the same areas uh, over, over the past 150 years. You know, NOAA has been uh, getting these uh, time series and pulling them together. And so what many people do when they don't have the computational uh, capability is they actually just go back and look at other past storms that have had similar uh, types to them, similar wind speeds and similar directionality and say, well, what has happened to these? And from that, they can create a distribution of what has happened. So the nature of this paper, the one that we've put together is uh, taking that basic core concept and applying it to uh, COVID projections here in Ontario. And again, the forecast is then simply uh, one where you just have to look at other areas across the globe that are similar to us in terms of something akin to latitude and longitude that we can then go back and then trace the, the forward path and figure out what might happen next. One of the key things you should note when you're looking at this, you can see how similar these paths are. So even the very complex compartmental style physical models uh, can be approximated by just these historical analogs. So what would you use if you're going to do this as your latitude and longitude? Now, when the pandemic started, and this is a picture from later in the pandemic, but I think it helps understand what's the, the key sort of drivers of what's happening is that you need to find something that makes one place very similar to another place. 
with all the different mechanisms for transmission outside of even the biology of the virus, um, we saw transmission rates and, and, and uh, wave patterns very different from place to place, even though the virus is, was largely the same. So what we started looking at was just the weekly growth rate, you know, just take seven days apart and look at the total new cases. And you follow this beautiful sort of blue smooth pattern um, that I think everybody is familiar with. But what, what most people were not familiar with was the red pattern in the acceleration and deceleration of this curve, which is shown down here. There are other lines on this graph, but they're not important for this discussion. But clearly there is an interplay between this first derivative of new cases and the second derivative. And in physics, we think of these as phase space, space, space plots. And so what we tried to do was, why don't we use this first derivative and second derivative as the basis of our latitude and longitude? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a, a period of time, uh, October the 1st of 2021, to show you what, um, what would happen if you were to do that. So if I go back to the historical record to everything before October, uh, 2000, before October 1st, 2001, I will find that there are many, many regions around the world that have gone through a similar acceleration and a similar uh, growth phase. And in some cases, they fared a lot better in terms of the total cases that could have happened and some much, much worse. So the graph that you're seeing here on the left-hand side is just the experience of regions around the world, different countries, um, prorated to where Ontario was on October 1st, 2021. And so what we decided to do is, as long as the sample is big, and you can see there's a very, very large sample here, and even when the pandemic began, there was also quite a large sample because there's so many places around the world experiencing this, that we were able to create forecasts. And so the forecast that we picked was just the, the median of all of these. But because we had the median, we could then pick up percentiles. We could guess as how much worse can it get? How much uh, better can it get? Are there areas in which uh, it'll do better and then maybe we should uh, mimic what's going on? But in every single case, you have a wide range of uh, possibilities that would come out. So here's what it looks like. So uh, on this graph from October 1st, 2021, I, I drew out the, um, the median in yellow and the 25th, the 75th percentiles in orange and purple. And then of course, the 90th and the 10th percentiles in green and blue. And, and then I noted on top of it, these, uh, these crosses, which were the actual rates, the actual cases that we saw. And you can see it hugs the uh, median beautifully. And at some point, as we started to hit that uh, Omicron wave, you can see a very strong move from one curve to the next. It didn't just also work in terms of total cases. The same kind of projections worked in uh, the case of just the total daily cases. And you can see that, again, for a long period of time, we were, we were hugging the projection. And then as the new wave started, we started to go well above it and then started crossing the boundaries for these things. We found that across the entire uh, gamut of the uh, pandemic, this method of projection worked extremely well for one week out, for two weeks out, up to about 120 days out. And let me show you some of the, uh, the, the results of how we measured that. So what we did was we took a look at every single place across the globe and we measured how its new cases, its total cases, compared to the projected cases when we did this projection. Again, making sure not to take into account any future cases that were in the process. Here's just the two week picture. And you can see that uh, on the X, on the Y axis is just the percentage difference, okay? And in time is just, of course, time. And you can clearly get a sense that the range of these numbers is something in the plus four to minus four range. The actual sigma is much smaller, right? It's something maybe on the order of about 1% with a bias to the upside. And always the bias to the upside comes where, when new waves would start um, and then you would underestimate some of the, uh, the effects. If you didn't just look at one week out but, or two weeks out, but you looked at all the days that you could project this, you found that there was a linear relationship between that error function and uh, how far you could forecast out. Literally, you could go out a month and only be off by about maybe plus minus 10% on what that total caseload would be. And as the window got worse and worse, obviously the, the accuracy got much worse. More interestingly was when you started looking at the daily cases in the same fashion, um, you found that outside of the, the, the start of really strong waves, uh, you found yourself having uh, errors that were very, very well much contained as well. And again, because you know when you're talking about caseloads of going from 2,000 to 4,000, you could see that there could be a 100% change. 
um, the scale of these two things is, is a little different. The interesting thing, again, is that there is a linear relationship between these, but then it breaks at some point into the, in the future. The conclusion is just very quickly, because I know we only have 10 minutes here, uh, is that we outlined, a, I think, a, a complementary approach to the, both the time series and the compartmental models that is solely based on looking at uh, past experiences across the globe. The key insight that we got, I'm sorry, is it is time up? No, 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 no uh, there yeah, must be some background. Here. Yeah, sorry about that. The key insight that we, we got while doing the work was that we were modeling all the various modes of transmission of the virus in society and not necessarily the biology of the virus like we would be doing in either a time series model or compartmental model. And so you started to see all the different aspects of uh, societal policy on, on top of the way the models were working, on top, on top of how people were interacting with each other. And you had many examples across the globe of all the different possibilities. Um, the current implementation we have right now focuses on new case prediction, but we've applied this to deaths, recoveries, hospitalizations, and everything seems to work well, even in those contexts. There was quite a bit of uh, future work and extensions that we wanted to uh, dig into, uh, again, time being the key concern. Uh, first, many of the material deviations that we see, they, we don't actually see them as bugs. We see them as, as uh, features of the model. Every time that we've had a material pop in an in inability to catch something, it's always been the result of a variant or something very specific happening in that particular location. So this type of work can maybe be used as a red flag or an early warning signal as to something really picking up. And we've seen this both in England and South Africa and in all the places where variants, it's been um, incredible what you've been able to see. Other things that we can do that we've spent a lot of time doing was then doing conditional modeling. So different areas, right now all we're doing is looking at the acceleration and the growth rates. We could be conditioning these on stringency policies on other metrics to help really focus in on which areas look most like the area we're interested in. Uh, again, it came down to questions of sample size and time, but that seems another great place to go. There is another area that we found really fascinating, which was um, looking at futures with no historical precedent. In other words, we took the same set of viral outbreaks that we have here, and we applied it to Ebola, and we applied it to a number of other vir viruses that we have data for, to see if the projections from here would match the transmissions we were seeing. And again, it looks like there's actually some strong predictability there, which would totally, which sounds totally bizarre when, you, when I say it, but when you think of this as just being the way um, a virus transmits through a society, maybe there's a way to take the pandemic data and use it for pandemics of the future, outbreaks of different diseases. I think there's some really interesting work that can be going on over there. And finally, again, going back to the deviations and, and figuring out the accelerations, we can use these as early warning signals for where we want to travel, where we don't want to travel before we actually start seeing the growth rates start to happen. I'm going to leave you with one thought. Here's the projection for uh, from March 31st. Um, again, if we follow the median, which is down here, we'll probably be in around 2,000 cases, but it'll climb uh, till about the middle of June. Again, worst case is that we see these huge, huge jumps uh, in caseloads uh, as, as we start going forward, which we're kind of hearing in the news through um, the, the wastewater uh, numbers and other things. Again, uh, interesting work, and again, a very different lens on, on, a, on the same problem that every one of us is working on. Thank you, Monica. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that is fantastic work. It looks really, really, really good and very, very appetizing for the future, let's just say, um, uh, to, to, to try and teach us something. Um, 